Welcome to the services today. We're glad you're a part of, of services here at the Linden Christian Church. From Psalm 85, the psalmist says, verses 8 and 9, Let me hear what God, the Lord, will speak. For He will speak peace to His people, to His saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely His salvation is near to those who fear Him, that glory may dwell in our land. Well, we pray for peace and God's glory here in the United States and in the world, in Latvia and wherever in the world that uh, people are. We pray that God will be able to touch them. Uh, we're going to begin the service this morning with a word of prayer. And out on the table in the foyer is a prayer list that has uh, these things that I'm going to mention. There are several mentioned on here. Many have cancer. Many are recu uh, recuperating from surgeries and injuries. I might just mention three or four. Uh, Marvina Boker, who lives at the house closest to us here, right, uh, shares our driveway as you're going out. I guess that's on that side. But Marvina has uh, injured herself and has had to have a shoulder replacement. And so uh, that's a big operation for anyone. So we need to pray for her. Uh, one of our former elders, he was an elder here at the church for years, was is Charlie Allen. And Charlie is uh, going through uh, preparations for some some serious uh, medical uh, procedures. So let's keep Charlie in our prayers. And I know Vince Lapolito, Vince just had knee surgery. I guess he had knee replacement. So, uh, and is he walking on canes, crutches, and all that kind of stuff? But he's up and walking. That's great. Praise the Lord for that. One last thing I'll mention, Jeannie and Patrick Monroe are part of our church here, and their grandson Thomas, Thomas Monroe, is eight years old. He has been sick and on our prayer list off and on for a number of months and even a long time longer than that. But uh, little Thomas, at eight years old, is now on the transplant plant list to have a new heart. And so we need to pray for Thomas, pray for his family, and... Uh, Pray that God's will will be done in their lives. Now you may notice that some of the children are wearing some little costumes this morning. After uh, communion this morning, I'm going to take the kids out. Some other adults are going with me, so don't fear. But we're going to take the kids out and go in Fellowship Hall. And we're going to uh, have a little time together, a little spiritual time, a little time of decorating some pumpkins and some snacks. And uh, we, will, we will do our best to, to fill your children full of candy and sugar so that you can take them home and they'll be bouncing off the wall. Maybe not, but we'll see what happens. But uh, it's, it's a great time for us to be together as a, as a church. Let me pray and we'll begin our worship this morning. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for these whom we've mentioned on our prayer list and others who are listed here. So many, Father, that are ill, some with cancers, some uh, with serious, serious illnesses like that and some who are recuperating from injuries, others who just are just having difficulty in life, feeling poorly. And Father, we lift all of these up to you. May we be a blessing to them. And Father, we pray that you bless them. Bless us that we'll be able to minister to them and to each other. Bless our services this morning, Father, that in all things we'll lift up Jesus in what we say and do. And now, Father, we pray that you would bless as we worship you and uh, be with the preacher as he shares a message from your word that we'll take it to heart. Now we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The, the communion service, the Lord's Supper that Jesus instituted is mentioned in several places in the Bible. But among the places is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me read a couple of verses here where the Apostle Paul talks about it. Beginning in verse 23. The Apostle Paul says to the, to the church, to the Christians, For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul passes on to them and to us our Lord's emphasis upon two 
remarkable symbols, the bread and the cup. Deliberately, after the Passover feast, Jesus took the bread. This was something new to the disciples, to the apostles. And when he had broken it to make it available to all the disciples, he said to them, this is my body. Unfortunately, some have taken that to mean that he was teaching that the bread literally becomes his body. But as you look at the story of the upper room, it's clear that he meant in a symbolic sense, it is his body. If it was literal, then there were two bodies of Christ present in the upper room, one in which he lived and occupied and by which he held the bread and then the bread itself. But clearly our Lord means this is a symbol. This represents my body, which is for you, he's telling us. And following that, our Lord took the cup. The, the juice of the cup symbolizes his blood, which is said to be the blood of the new covenant. And that's the church. The church is his new covenant, the new arrangement for living that God has made by which the, the old life is ended. That is what blood always means. Blood is the end of a life and the old life in which we were dependent upon ourselves and lived for ourselves and wanted only to be the center of attention is over. That's what the cup means. We agree to that. We are no longer to live for ourselves. You don't have final rights to your life and the price of the blood of Jesus is what was paid so that we can be a part of, of Christ. Therefore, this morning when we take that cup and, and drink it and when we are doing that, we are publicly proclaiming that we agree with that sentence of death upon our old life and believe that the Christian life is a continual experience of life coming out of, coming out of death. Power with God only comes when we die to the wisdom and the power of man. We give up one so that the other may be manifest in us. That's what the cup means. It's a beautiful picture of what Jesus said of himself. In, uh, in John's Gospel in chapter 12, he says, uh, except a corn of wheat, King James says. Some of the modern versions say a, a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die except this kernel fall into the ground and die it abides alone nothing is more descriptive of the emptiness of life than that phrase abides alone alone lonely restless bored miserable unhappy that's the life that tries to live for itself and its own needs and its own rights but the Christian life that we live is one in which that is freely and voluntarily surrendered. If the corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it'll bring forth much fruit, many kernels. And by the participation of the cup, this is what we're declaring, the Lord's death until he comes. Let me pray, and then we'll partake of the bread and the juice. Thank you, Father, for your Son, our Savior, whom you sent to die for us, to live a perfect life and to die and be buried, but then on the third day to rise from the dead, never to die again, and who now has ascended to heaven and sits at your right hand, prepared to come back and take us home with him, with you forever. Now bless us as we partake. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's partake of the bread. And the juice. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good, good. I didn't catch that. Oh, all right. Uh, well, uh, I had a good day yesterday. U of L. Cardinals won. Go Cards. Uh, I hear some other people might not be having such a good day, but you know, that's all right. Uh, I've been there too, so. 
Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and uh, get started, um, and let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you so much for another day to uh, study your word, to learn more uh, about your will for our life, how to live a blessed life. We thank you so much for uh, giving us instructions on how to live this life in the best way we can, uh, where we will find enjoyment, where we will find peace, uh, where we will... Um, uh, live in such a way that we are blessed and that we bless others. Uh, God, I pray that you would help us to do that. Uh, help us to be wise with how we handle the gifts that you've given us uh, so that we can bring honor to you. Uh, God, thank you so much for so many uh, material blessings that all of us uh, have, but also, and more importantly than that, thank you so much for all the spiritual blessings that you give us, uh, peace and hope and love and salvation through your son. Uh, thank you for naming us as part of your family and uh, for appointing us for heaven. Uh, it's in your name I pray. Amen. Uh, on the evening of June 15th, 2013, Brianna Mitchell was on her way home from work when she, uh, the tire of her SUV blew out on rural two-lane burleson Retta Road on the outskirts of Fort, Fort Worth, Texas. As she rumbled to a stop, uh, Holly Boyles and her daughter Shelby, who lived in, nearby, ran out to help. Holly was a homemaker and a devoted member of Cana Baptist Church in Burleson, Texas. Her daughter Shelby was studying to be a nurse at the University of Louisiana at Monroe. Uh, Brian Jennings, a youth minister at nearby Alsbury Baptist Church, was on his way home from his son Evan's graduation party. Uh, leaving his two middle school-aged boys in the car, he pulled over to offer assistance as well. Uh, about an hour before all of this took place, 17-year-old Ethan Couch had stolen two cases of beer from a local Walmart, jumped into his father's Ford F-350 and barreled down the road with seven of his friends in the back going 70 miles per hour. Now, when they approached Brianna Mitchell's SUV uh, the, that was stranded on the side of the road, Couch swerved and crashed into the vehicle, hitting and killing all four people. Uh, the truck then hit Brian Jennings' car with his two kids in it, which in turn hit an oncoming vehicle before flipping multiple times and uh, tossing many of the passengers out onto the ground. Uh, Ethan Couch and his seven passengers, as well as uh, Brian Jennings' two boys and the, the two passengers in the oncoming vehicle, uh, all survived with minor, mostly minor injuries. Uh, two of Couch's passengers, however, two of his friends uh, received serious injuries, one of which, a uh, former soccer player, was permanently paralyzed. Uh, Couch was charged with intoxicated manslaughter. And his defense team argued that he was a product of affluenza, uh, that he was unable to link his actions to consequences because his parents had taught him that wealth and money buys privilege and that the law didn't apply to him because he was wealthy. As his father owned a successful uh, metal sheeting company, he, he went to upscale private schools and he mostly lived in his family's second home all by himself as a high schooler. His parents indulged his every desire, and there was never any consequences for him. In this extreme case of overindulgence, numerous lives were forever changed, and four lives were lost altogether. Life is a gift from God, and He blesses us with so many things for our enjoyment. He has given us so many things that He wants us to indulge in. But overindulgence in those things is dangerous. 
Uh, I've heard it said that when good things become ultimate things, they become destructive things. That is so true. When we overindulge in anything, it becomes destructive. It's good to indulge in things that bring you joy. You should indulge in pleasures because, God, because our joy brings God joy. He has given us those things for our enjoyment. And yet you should also deny yourself those things. It is important to set limits, right? Not only to keep those things from endangering us, but also so that we will be able to be ready to share with others. Uh, we're in the final week of this sermon series called Hashtag Blessed, where we've been talking about how to lead a blessed life. What are some things that we can do in our lives? What is some ancient wisdom that we can apply to our lives from the Bible so that our lives will be blessed? Uh, in this teaching series, we've talked about uh, the importance of spending money wisely, We've talked about doing work that allows you to use the gifts that God has given you. Last week, we talked about being generous. All of these things, if we uh, apply them to our life, if we uh, apply these principles to our life, we will lead a life of blessing. They will lead to you li living a blessed life. Now, this morning, we're going to talk about the importance of investing investing your money in such a way that it grows. But in order to do that, you need to have margin in your budget. You need to set limits on things and not overindulge. Uh, we, we mentioned the importance of having a budget at the beginning of the sermon series. Uh, it's, it's very important to know where your money is going uh, so that you can make sure that it's going toward the things that you want it to go towards. If you do not have a plan for your money, your money will be scattered to the wind. If you are going to be successful in anything, you need to have a plan. And then work to execute that plan. Uh, if you go to build a house, for instance, without building plans, you are never going to be able to build a house. Carpenters won't know where to put up the walls. Uh, electricians won't know where to send the wires. Plumbers won't know where to put the toilet. And you will end up with something like this. <laughs> right? That is not something I want to see when I'm cooking breakfast. Okay? You need to have a plan. A budget is that plan for your money. Before the month begins, you write down uh, your monthly income, and underneath it, you, know, you write out all of your expenses that you are going to have throughout the month, and you assign a, an amount of money to each one. That, that's all a budget is. You can do that on a piece of paper. Uh, you can use a budgeting app. Uh, there's a, a great budgeting app called Every Dollar. That's the one I use, and uh, it works very well. You can, direct, you can connect it directly to your bank account so that every expense goes right into the app. And uh, you don't really have to do a whole lot. It, it's very easy. It works great. Uh, but once you go through and you assign a dollar amount to all of your expenses, your rent, your mortgage, uh, your food, your utilities, everything, after you do that, there should ha you should have money left over. That's called margin. Uh, if you don't have margin, if all of your expenses is all of your, uh, equals all of your income... If you don't have money left over, you need to create margin. Uh, you can do that in two ways, two ways that we've already talked about through this series. Uh, you need to either cut expenses, cut out things from your budget that are unhealthy, that are unwise. Uh, maybe you can pay off debt and that, uh, th those payments are no longer in your budget. That creates margin. Or if you don't have anything that you can possibly cut out of your budget, you can work on raising your income. Uh, you can do this. Uh, we talked about this uh, in week two. We talked about cutting expenses in week one. We talked about raising your income in week two. Uh, if you missed any of those, uh, you can go to our YouTube page and check those out. Uh, but uh, only spend money on things that make you healthy, 
invest in your career uh, by getting educated or certified uh, to do a higher paying job or, or start your own business using your gifts to serve people. If you do those two things, cut expenses, raise your income, you will have margin in your budget. There are three things that you can do with that margin in your budget. Now, what we talked about one of those last week. You can give, give it away. You can be generous. Uh, last week, uh, if you missed that series, you can go, or that sermon, you can go back on YouTube and watch that. Uh, but last week, I talked about three different ways that you can be generous. And I talked about how those could, those equal, if you do all three of those things, uh, those would equal about a quarter, less than a quarter of your income, less than a 25%. Uh, the next two things that you can do with the margin in your budget is to spend some of it on luxuries and to invest it so that it will grow. Now, I would suggest that you spend about 10% on luxuries, on uh, things that bring you joy, on things that you find pleasurable in life, and 15% on investing. Uh, for those math majors, I had to get out a calculator for this one, but uh, that totals 50%. Give 25%, invest 15%, and uh, spend 10% on luxuries items, on, on things that you find enjoyment. Uh, that leaves 50, 50%, another 50%, on your living expenses. That should be your goal to get your living expenses to about 50% of your income. This is ancient financial wisdom. If you can live on 50% of your income, you will live a blessed life because you will be able to give very generously. You will be able to experience luxuries that bring joy to your life and you will be able to invest your money so that it continues to grow. And I understand that some of you may laugh at that idea. Who can live on 50% of their income? Especially now with inflation, right? Some of you may not be able to do that. That your expenses are far more than 50% of your income. Some of you may not be able to do that right now. And that's okay. But if you work toward that goal, one day it will be attainable. But it will only happen if you have a plan. Proverbs 21.5 says, The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance. That's margin. But everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. There is no get-rich-quick scheme. All of those so-called uh, get-rich-quick schemes only lead to poverty. Having a plan and sticking to it will lead to abundance, that will lead to margin. There will be margin in your budget to give and to spend some on yourself and to invest in future growth. Again, that, that plan is to cut out unhealthy things from your budget and to work to increase your income by using your gifts to serve people and meet their needs. That's it. That's how you will live a blessed life. That's how you will be hashtag blessed. And all of that comes from ancient financial wisdom found in the Bible. That's it. Let's go. Right, we're out of here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that's, that's easier said than done, isn't it? It's, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, just live on 50%, and then you can give 25 and so on. It's a lot easier said than done. It's not easy to live on 50% of your income. And, and even if you do, even if you're able to reach that goal, attain that goal, to live on 50%, it's not easy to stick to the 25, 15, 10 principle with your margin. Give 25%, invest 15%, and spend 10%. Now, some people are wired for generosity. If you say, uh, give 25%, you'll be like, they say, that's all? I can do more than that. Some are wired for generosity, and if they're not careful, they will give all of their money away. Now, some people are wired for pleasure, and if they're not careful, they're going to spend and spend and spend. 
They're going to spend all their money. And some people are wired for saving. And if they're not careful, they will squirrel all their money away and not use any of it. The Bible has words to say about all these things. Uh, last week, we, we talked about four different people who were not generous. One of those people was, if you remember, was the rich fool. If you remember, he, he gained so much wealth that he decided just to sit back and eat and drink and be merry for the rest of, of his life. He had a penchant for saving, right? He, he took all of his surplus and he put it into barns to save it for later. So he could just live on it for the rest of his life. But he was called a fool for doing that, right? He was overindulging in savings. Overindulging in savings is called foolishness. Use what you have been given. Save some, but use the rest. Now, you may be familiar with the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, when I grew up, uh, as I was growing up, I, I never knew what the word prodigal meant. Uh, I kind of always assumed that it just meant someone who went astray or someone who went off on their own. But actually, the word prodigal, I looked it up, uh, it actually means reckless. It means spending money recklessly or extravagantly. Uh, the, the, the prodigal son, he had a fondness for the finer things in life. That might be some of you. But he blew through his entire inheritance, spending it on luxurious living. He ended up eating pig slop because he didn't have any money left over to buy food for himself. Overindulgence in spending on luxuries will lead you to a similar, similar place. Uh, interestingly, uh, the Bible has the best things to say about people who overindulge in generosity. Uh, Jesus actually told one person, we talked about him last week, he was a rich young ruler. Uh, Jesus told him to sell all of his possessions, everything that he had, and give to the poor. Uh, there was a, a widow, uh, this story is found at Luke chapter 21. This widow, she put two coins in the offering box at, at the synagogue. Uh, there were wealthy people giving bags and bags of gold. But Jesus commended the widow for her generosity. This is what Jesus said. And he said, to, and he said truly I tell you, this poor widow has put, uh, put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, out of their margin. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. At the same time, we've talked about this. Uh, we talked about this in week two. Paul said at 1 Timothy 4.8, that if anyone does not provide for his own household, meaning living expenses... He has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That, that, that seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? That, that, that she gave what she had to live on, but if you don't have money to live on, you're worse than an unbeliever. You've denied the faith. How, how does that work out? Well, the context of this statement by Jesus to the widow is important. It's not really about what the widow gave. It's really about her heart compared to the heart of the wealthy people. Uh, the wealthy were giving to be honored themselves for their generosity. The widow gave out of a generous heart. Uh, beyond that, it was, it was actually an, an indictment on these wealthy people. They were supposed to be taking care of the widow. The fact that she only had two coins is the problem. The wealthy people were wealthy because they took advantage of people like the widow. Just before this statement in Luke 21, Jesus gave a warning about these people. He said, they devour widows' houses, meaning they cheat and steal from people like her in order to gain their wealth. Jesus doesn't require us to give everything away. 
He wants us to give from a generous heart. That was the problem with the rich ruler. His heart was set on his possessions and not on God. And so we ought to take care of our household by having money to live on, but keep your living expenses or set your goal at keeping your living expenses to about 50% so that you will have margin for giving, for spending, and investing. But if you're going to overindulge in something, it should be giving. Don't give it away to your detriment so that you don't have money to live on, but give it away. And so the 25, 15, 10 principle is a good way to keep from overindulging. But for the vast majority of us, let's be honest, being, being generous is not what we tend to overindulge in. I don't know about you, but for me, it's overindulging and spending on luxuries, right? Spending it on myself. And I'm not talking about, you know, when I say luxuries, uh, people think about lifestyles of the rich and famous. I'm not really talking about billionaire luxuries like trips to outer space or uh, private jets, uh, vacations to Fiji. That's not really what I'm, what I'm talking about. I'm talking about normal, everyday luxuries. Things like vacations to the beach or to the mountains, uh, eating out at restaurants, um, be, uh, buying pumpkin spice lattes, for instance. These are all luxuries. Um, spending money on, on our hobbies, on, on uh, going to sporting events, concerts. If you are creating a budget, you're going to list out your expenses that, th- that you have to live on. None of those things are, are needed for, for you to live, right? Some of you, maybe uh, pumpkin spice lattes are, are necessary to live, uh, but uh, they are not necessary for living. And so they would not go in that category. They would go in the luxury category. And so all of those things should not total more than 10% of your income. If you make 5000 a month, for instance, you would be able to spend $500 on luxuries. So, so you could maybe put $100 a month aside uh, to take a vacation later on. Uh, maybe you could set $200 aside a month for doing things like going to concerts or eating out at restaurants. Uh, maybe $100 toward uh, a hobby that you enjoy, uh, maybe uh, $75 for a sporting events, something like that. Uh, and then, then just $25 uh, for pumpkin, pumpkin spice lattes. Uh, for some of you that's heresy, $25? It's November. I'm spending all the $500 on that, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, if, you, if you remember uh, back a couple weeks ago, we talked about a Jewish rabbi named Sirach. Uh, He had some great ancient financial wisdom that were based on biblical principles. This is what he had to say about using up all your money on luxuries. Sirach 1832. Do not revel in great luxury, lest you become impoverished by its expense. That's good advice. That's what happened to the prodigal son. But at the same time, we can swing back to the other extreme. Uh, There are some people who say that holiness requires you to live like a monk, right? That Jesus wants us to live ascetically and to renounce all worldly uh, goods and possessions, to take a vow of poverty, right? If If you want to do that, you're certainly free to do that, but that is not what is required of you to be holy. It's perfectly okay to enjoy the fruits of your labor by indulging in, in moderation in luxury. Now, this is what Sirach had to say about that. Sirach 14, 14. Do not deprive yourself of a happy day. Let not your share of desired good pass you by. This is what King Solomon himself wrote at Ecclesiastes 5.18. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun. The few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them. And to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil 
be content is meaning accept his lot. This is the gift of God. Enjoying the fruits of your labor by indulging in luxury from time to time is a, is a gift of God. Take a vacation. Enjoy a hobby. Take pleasure in things that entertain you. This is good and it is fitting. And it is a gift of God. But overindulging in those things is dangerous. When good things become ultimate things, they become destructive things. Uh, so have a plan and stick to it so that the gift that God has given you doesn't become a curse. Not only will overindulging in spending uh, endanger you from not having money to live on, it can also erode your ability to be generous. So the, the 15% investing is very important. At 1 Timothy 6.18, uh, Paul instructed the wealthy to be ready to share. Be ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. Investing 15% of your income is how you set a good foundation for the future. It's how you store up treasure for yourself so that you're ready to share. Uh, being generous is good. If you have $1,000 and you give that entire $1,000 away, that is good. It is, you have done something good. But if you invest 15% of that $1,000, 150 of that $1,000, so that it gives you a return, you will be able to continue to be generous into the future. You can give all of it now, or you can give some of it now, and even more later. As that investment grows, you will be able to continually be generous. If you do not invest it, all of it will be gone. Now, this is what Proverbs 27, 23, and 24 says. Know well the condition of your flocks, and give attention to your herds, for riches do not last forever. Pay attention to the condition of your flocks and your herds. The, the, this was an agrarian society, obviously, and so a person's wealth uh, was often tied up in their livestock. Uh, if they didn't pay attention, any number of things could wreak havoc on their flocks. A lack of food or water source, predators, disease, uh, not paying attention would cause their wealth to be eroded away. But the same thing happens today. If you do not pay attention, your wealth will be eroded away. Now, today, our wealth is largely tied up in two things, uh, retirement accounts and real estate. Now, according to Fidelity, one of the largest investment firms in the United States, there are about 750,000 retirement accounts with a balance of over a million dollars. And there are almost 22 million millionaires in the United States. The vast majority of them have their money in real estate and retirement accounts that total over a million dollars. And so owning your home, putting money into an IRA or a 401k is the best way to build a foundation for the future so that you will continually be ready to share. And so to finish up this morning, uh, I know I'm just a preacher, but uh, I'm going to put on my financial advisor cap today, and I want to give you some financial advising. Uh, I'm not an official uh, professional financial uh, advisor by any means, so uh, I can't tell you what specifically to invest in. I can't tell you, oh man, invest in that stock because it's, it's on its way up. I don't know anything about that. Uh, but there are some practical investing principles uh, that I want to give you today to help you invest your money so that it will grow, so that you'll always be able to be generous. Remember, the purpose of being generous, it goes beyond just helping someone. It is ultimately about creating opportunities to lead them to Christ. Now, the first investing principle I want to give you is invest in what you know. If you don't know anything about real estate, if you don't know anything about uh, the stock market, don't 
invest in those things until you know about them. Uh, Proverbs 13, 16 says this, In everything the prudent acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly. Only act with knowledge. Uh, People who brag about all their savvy investing strategies are simply flaunting their folly. You don't have to have all these uh, fancy kinds of investing strategies. Invest in simple things that you know about, that you have knowledge about. And if you don't know about it, don't invest in it until you learn about it. Uh, Dave Ramsey suggests investing in uh, mutual funds and, and real estate. But if you don't know anything about those things, learn about them first and only act with knowledge so that you'll be able to make wise decisions. Uh, I would suggest uh, seeking out a real financial advisor, not me, obviously, uh, but someone who can teach you about uh, some, some simple things like mutual funds and real estate that you can invest in. Uh, the second investing principle comes from a book called um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, his na- name is, uh, the author's name is Robert Kiyosaki. Uh, and he says that savers are losers. Uh, that's not an insult, okay? Uh, people who only save their money lose their money because of inflation. And we all know this, right? Uh, we're all losing our money because of inflation right now. On average, on any given year, inflation is about 3 to 4% uh, year over year. Uh, obviously, right now, it's above average, right? Uh, but if you put your money in a savings account, even if it's a high-yield savings account or a CD, your interest rate is going to be less than the rate of inflation. So the value of those dollars that are in that account, it goes down every single year. Uh, So $1,000 sitting in a savings account will be worth on average about 4% less the next year. So even if you're making 2% interest, you're actually losing money. You should be investing in things that will bring you a higher return so that in the future, you'll be ready to share. Uh, You should invest in things that outpace inflation inflation, so your money doesn't just erode away. Pay attention to your flocks and herds. Uh, this, the S&P 500 stock index, uh, it, has an, it has averaged over 11% uh, every single year over the past 100 years. Uh, the average rate of return on residential real estate is over 10%. Uh, those investments outpace inflation. Uh, uh, the third financial principle that I want to leave you with this morning is to start now. Uh, I've heard it said that the best time to start investing was 30 years ago. Uh, but the second best time is right now, it's today. Uh, if, you sh- if you would have started 30 years ago, obviously you would have had 30 years of returns. Uh, but if you start today, you will set yourself up for the future. Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. If you wait for the perfect time, it will never come. So do it today. And you will set yourself up to be ready to share in the future. You'll be storing up treasure for yourself as a foundation for the future. Uh, By investing your money so that it will grow, you will always be able to be generous. So that you'll create opportunities to lead people to Christ. Uh, Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this ancient financial wisdom. Uh, Thank you so much for um, uh, guidance and and wisdom uh, that we can follow to live a blessed life. Uh, Help us not to set money as our goal, but living the way you want us to to live as our goal. Help us to be open-handed with the things that you have given us so that we can uh, share with other people, so that we can ultimately lead them to the hope they have in you. God, help us to be a giving church, a a church that puts the needs of other people before our own, and that we would use the blessings and the resources you have given us to bless people in this community and to lead people to you. Uh, It's in your name I pray. Amen.